Thank you to everyone for joining us here tonight. My name is Sue Brockbank and I'm a conservation specialist with the Grand River Conservation Authority. We're pleased to host this webinar on profit mapping from data to dollars to share some of the work that we've been doing. For the last 10 months, and with funding from the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, we've undertaken a profit mapping demonstration project in Brant County and Waterloo Region to test profit mapping as a tool to identify areas for management practice changes to profitability and benefit the environment. This could be changes to inputs, seeding rates or tillage, or adding cover crops or erosion control structures. We know that maximizing nutrient use efficiency and minimizing soil loss are good for both farm sustainability and watershed health. A win-win. We've connected with 10 growers in the area. Some were newer to precision agriculture and some had many years of yield data and developed profit maps to help show the profit and losses across various fields. The growers then and continue now to have funding available to access CCA services such as variable rate scripts and soil sampling to further delve into that information and figure out what's going on. And at the Grand River Conservation Authority, we can offer funding through the Rural Water Quality Program for stewardship projects on these properties. I want to send a special thank you to the Brant and Waterloo Soil and Crop Improvement Associations for supporting the project and connecting us with interested growers. Just some housekeeping before we get started. We have mics and video turned off to help with sound and to reduce the video streaming for folks with slower internet capabilities. If you have any questions tonight, please feel free to put them into the chat. We'll also be recording this webinar tonight to share, so that's another reason to keep videos turned off for privacy. With that, I'd like to introduce Aaron Breimer, VP of Data Insights at Devron and the creator behind the profit maps we've been using. So as uh, Sue mentioned, uh, the title of uh, today's uh, presentation is Profit Mapping from Data to Dollars. Uh, she also introduced uh, myself as working for a company called uh, Devron. Um, for those of you who uh, know me uh, from uh, my time working with Veritas, Devron owns Veritas. So that's kind of, kind of the connection on the differences Devron is across North America. So. I get to uh, work in a, a few different areas uh, besides Ontario these days. So within Devron, we talk about five main pillars. We'll get this uh, marketing stuff out of the way super quick and we'll get into the good stuff. So the first thing is that anything that Devron does, we want to make it simple. Um, when we talk about simple, this is simple for the um, end user, for the customer, for the farmer, for our partners in the ag retail space. Um, for uh, independent agronomists that we work with, it has to be simple for them to execute. Um, everyone that we work with, we recognize how busy they are. So some of the stuff that we do, um, we will make it look that, hey, this is very simple. Um, but when you get it deeper into it, um, the actual execution can be uh, somewhat difficult. Key uh, for us is um, upfront, we want it to be simple to uh, utilize and to adapt. The next piece is I truly believe every farm is unique. Um, this was something I uh, learned about uh, uh, 15 years ago, uh, working with uh, farmers at, and uh, we had a research uh, farm and uh, you take farmers through the research farm, showing them all the interesting things you're working on. And uh, it was a very high yielding productive uh, research farm. And uh, just about every individual farmer uh, would tell me, well, that's interesting, but that's not my farm. So uh, um, understanding and then accepting that uh, every farm is unique and uh, the idea of a cookie cutter approach, um, it, it rarely, rarely works. Constantly innovating. Um, some of the people that I work with, uh, they're incredibly smart, but sometimes they get a little frustrated with me because I'm constantly trying to uh, figure out different things to build to be able to add value to the, the data that farmers um, and other people in the ag industry are, are creating. Um, I truly believe that uh, when we sit still, um, that's when the world passes us by. So I'm constantly trying to innovate and understand um, how we can uh, keep uh, pushing the bar forward. This is a big piece for me. Um, I get to do some really cool stuff with some really incredible equipment but it has to make money. And well, technically it has to bring value. So um, for me, that's usually uh, on making money, but let's be honest, it could be saving money or it could be reducing workload, um, making life uh, easier, um, but it has to bring value. And if that value can't be measured, 
it's pretty hard to uh, convince uh, people to adapt long term if they're not seeing that value. And then the final piece is inclusive. Um, the ag industry is very good at talking about working collaboratively. Um, that said, my experience is that that level of collaboration pales in comparison to what farmers can do. Farmers, they are the experts at working collaboratively with each other. It's absolutely incredible to, to see. So when uh, I see the, uh, the egg industry talking about uh, working collabor collaboratively, um, I look to, to farmers and say, hey, we can do better. So this is, it's a, an easy one to put down, but uh, it's, uh, it's probably the one that takes the, the most work uh, in my, uh, my opinion. So that's the marketing stuff. Let's get into the good stuff. So the, we're going to be talking about the 2021 um, Grand River Conservation Authority profit mapping project. Um, some of this stuff uh, Sue was uh, already mentioning. Um, Sue uh, reached out to me last fall in uh, 2020, um, and she had this idea of being able to um, do profit mapping at a pilot project uh, level um, with some of the farmers in their watershed and to be able to understand the value. Um, we've been doing, I have been doing a nice bit of profit mapping with, uh, with uh, several different uh, farmers for the last uh, oh, three to four years. Um, and I've been exposed to it for probably about uh, five or six years. So it isn't uh, that it's a completely new concept. It's just, it doesn't get used very often. It's one of those things you see in meetings and you're like, hey, that's really cool. That's going to take off. And it just never seems to take off. And uh, so people have been aware of profitability mapping. It's just, yeah, it's just one of those interesting things that uh, um, everybody likes the output, but it does take a nice bit of work to actually be, uh, get it up and, up and running. So uh, hats off to Sue. Um, and the rest of the, the team at the Grand River Conservation Authority to be able to push this forward. Um, they were able to secure some funding uh, from OMAFRA. Um, I believe in uh, December 2020, it might have been a little bit sooner than that, but that's what they let me know. Um, and in, in December uh, 2020, uh, the GRCA uh, put together a steering committee, um, including uh, themselves, uh, some farmers, as well as some in industry uh, collaborators. I was, uh, I was one of them. There was a couple other ag retailers involved. Um, so a lot of different perspectives uh, being brought to, to that steering committee. Sue mentioned that uh, from January to March 2021, um, they were able to enroll 10 farmers to participate in that pilot project. Um, and that's pretty impressive. Um, quite often pilot projects that I see is one or two uh, um, uh, people at the most. But they actually got 10, and, and that says a lot uh, um, on the general interest of this concept. Um, starting in, I'm going to say it was in late February, early March, uh, we started to collect historical yield and production data. Um, some of the uh, uh, industry collaborators um, were huge assets in this. Obviously, uh, with COVID, it kind of limits how much... Uh, um, traveling around, I can do it to pull data directly. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, um, why that support on being able to, to pull data um, is, is so valuable. So being able to have that collaborative uh, approach uh, was a huge asset. Um, and uh, we even uh, roped in uh, Sue into doing uh, some uh, collecting historical data. And uh, um, I have to say, I, she, I'm pretty impressed. Um, she, she can uh, hang out with me any day uh, collecting uh, yield data. So any of you who are sitting there going, not sure how to pull data out of a monitor or, or platform, uh, Sue might be able to help you out now. Um, and then uh, starting in April and uh, um, continuing today, we have been producing uh, profitability uh, uh, mapping reports. And we're going to get into some of those. One of the things uh, that uh, we had hoped to be able to do was to be able to produce the, the profit mapping reports um, prior to uh, spring rush, but with everything, all the different moving pieces, um, that, that hasn't uh, fully happened and, and we'll share a little bit more about that. And so because of that, um, we've, uh, I've extended the, the offer to the, uh, um, the farmer participants that uh, any data profitability or sorry, any production data 
and yield data that they generate for 2021, we are going to be supplying them with a profitability uh, report for, for 2021. So um, that, I guess that the project continues. And as soon as that yield data starts uh, to flow in, um, we'll be able to, to start generating reports and then they will have all winter to be able to take advantage of the information contained within that. All right, so what profitability mapping is, is it's basically taking the concept. So I've worked in the ag retail industry um, starting in 2001, and I'm originally from, uh, from a farm um, north of London and, and dad still farms there. And, and one of the things that I learned uh, when I was at the University of Guelph, and it seems to be one of the things that you hear at every grain marketing course that you go to is that in order to be an effective grain marketer, you have to know your cost of production. Well, profitability mapping is taking that same concept, but instead of looking at what is your cost of production on a per field basis, it's actually looking at the profitability within the field. So how does the hill compare to the valley? How does the headlands compare to the, the interior of the field? And so it, it's literally looking at what we call in the map world, the geospatial distribution of profitability. Where in that field are you making the most money and where are you eh, maybe not making as much money? So the key data layer behind all of this is yield maps. If you don't have good yield maps, it's really, really hard to do profitability mapping. Not impossible. Um, I've done some stuff uh, using uh, drone imagery and satellite imagery. Um, if you can hit the, uh, um, the timing of that imagery correct and get the uh, good correlation to yield, it can be done that way, but ultimately you need that, uh, that yield data. Now, some of the participants uh, in the program, they had been doing variable rate application. And for those uh, folks, we were able to incorporate their variable rate uh, applications into that profitability map because their costs are variable across the field as well. That said, the majority of costs for um, across a field are going to be fixed. Um, they might be variable costs, but they're fixed and it's, it's uniform across uh, the field. So um, we, we did, for the most part, what we did was we used um, uh, fixed costs uh, set by um, OMAFRA, or if uh, there was a far, uh, if a farmer wanted us to utilize uh, their individual numbers, we were happy to do that. So this is literally what a profitability map uh, um, looks like. Um, you're going to get to see a, a few uh, different ones, but it, it basically shows the distribution. Now, honestly, it looks a lot like a yield map. And it kind of makes sense that it's going to look like a, a lot like a yield map because that's what's generating uh, this whole thing. But it's showing you what part of your field you're actually making money. Now, this is uh, coming. There's a bunch of different platforms that do profitability mapping. Um, I I use uh, a couple of different ones. Um, so I just grab some screen grabs uh, to be able to share, so that way I'm not sharing people's uh, data. Um, but you can see the distribution of where you're making money and where you're not making money. So, and the percentage uh, that that's, uh, splits out uh, based on the, the different areas. Now, this is kind of interesting because this, uh, uh, this particular platform, about four years ago, um, I went to uh, a conference in the United States and I was listening to these guys talk about this particular platform. And this platform had a, has a lot of acres in the US subscribed. And back in 2017, these folks were, were reporting that 52% of the land that they had in their system, so not 52% of the fields, but 52% of the actual acreage was actually losing money. So overall, farmers were making money, but that there was 48% of the field that had to um, cover the losses of the other 52%. So if you think back to 2017, that kind of makes sense. Uh, crop price, commodity prices were a little bit lower um, and, uh, and crop yields weren't, uh, weren't as good either. Um, but to be honest, in uh, 2021 and in Ontario, um, that's probably not gonna be the case. I think that, um, we're very fortunate in 2021 to have what would appear to be uh, pretty good yields uh, coming our way. And uh, uh, for the most part, it's pretty good uh, um, commodity prices as well. Now, the interesting thing with data is you can um, make it look 
and do a lot of different things uh, with it. Um, so you can take a profitability map and you can look at what is your return on investment. Um, most people in the business world will tell you um, you should be looking at a return on investment between 10 and 15 percent. That's pretty rich in, in the agriculture world, in, in my experience. This particular field, you can see it's doing quite well. Um, but uh, um, 10 to 15 percent return on investment. Um, yeah, we're going to see that in 2021 in a lot of cases. But uh, to think that we're going to be seeing that year in and year out, I think that that's a, a little bit uh, more of a stretch. But yeah, you can see there's that ROI. So now this is where things get really interesting. If you, if you really like to play with data, um, you can actually start to um, take and segment out the parts of the field that are losing money. And you can start to look at how much of a yield increase you would actually have to have. So this is a cornfield and you can see um, there's a chunk of there's some of that that uh, um, all you need is another nine bushels and you're gonna be able to have a, um, a break even uh, proposition. So you can make an argument. Yeah, you get some timely rains, you're gonna be off to the races. But you look at that, there's 7% of the field that you would need an 89 bushel increase just to break even. You're talking some big, big numbers um, to be able to, to get 89 more bushels. I'm not saying that profitability mapping is gonna allow you to be able to fix that 89 uh, bushel, that 7%, uh, that you need 89 more bushels, but it's going to be able to identify it for you. And now you're gonna be able to start to make decisions as to how you want to be able to handle that. Um, this is always a fun one. Um, especially now because commodity prices are so good. Um, I had a mentor once tell me the cure for uh, uh, low prices is low prices and the cure for high prices is high prices. Well, right now we've got some pretty high prices for, for commodities. So I anticipate we may see a slump at some point in the future. Um, hopefully that's not the case, but I would anticipate at some point in the future, we're gonna see things go the other way. But in this particular case, you can see um, how much of a um, bushel increase or change in bushel um, you, that you need in order to um, have a break even. So um, when, you, you, when you're dealing with corn, keep in mind these are um, US prices on, in this example. So it um, looks a lot, a, a lot different. But this is what I mean is that you can get into some of these examples that are kind of interesting. Um, so, and then, like I said, I worked in ag retail for, for the first 10 years of my career. So this is always a, uh, a fun one, um, unless you work in ag retail. And that's the decrease in the, the cost of expenses. So you're going to um, basically cut your costs, maybe use a little less fertilizer, uh, maybe you're gonna see if you can get uh, your fertilizer at a little less, uh, little less expensive, or whatever the case may be. But you, once again, that's, there's that 7% that you have to figure out a way to save $356 per acre. That's a monster number. Um, so once again, it's like, you're probably not gonna get to break even, but maybe there's something else you can do there. And then the final one is this product efficiency. Uh, this gets into more advanced uh, uh, management uh, um, styles um, when you're starting to look at, it, at cash flow. Basically what it is, is it, it allows you to identify where you're going to get your best bang for your for your uh, cash flow dollars. So um, making sure that you're investing into the fields that make the most sense or the parts of the fields that are making the most sense. All right, um, basically uh, when everything's said and done, you can get something like this, a, a field report card. Um, the ones that we supplied uh, looked a little bit different. So this is 2015-ish. Um, you can see this was a screen grab that I grabbed. Um, you can get into some interesting things uh, um, with that to be able to see it, see what things look like. One of the things that we did for uh, the, the pilot project was uh, farmers who had historical data, we went back in time and they were able to flip through uh, um, different years. So, you, so you're gonna hear there are some people talk about that. We've actually got some, some uh, presentations. So once again, there, there's a little bit of that uh, field report card. Um, all right, you've heard me talk. Hopefully I haven't put anyone to sleep. What we're gonna do is we're gonna hear from a couple of participants. Um, first up, we're gonna listen, uh, hear from uh, Brian Dom. So hopefully my computer works.
Uh, I'm Brian Dom, um, the owner of Brian Dom Farms Limited. We got incorporated back in 1993, and uh, that's when our farm started to grow a lot. And we are grain cash crop growers uh, in the Waterloo region. And uh, yeah, we've uh, been farming close to 5,000 acres for probably 15 years, uh, give or take a few acres up and down every year based on uh, land changes and whatnot. Uh, we are in uh, North Dumfries Township with most of our land base. Uh, and yes, there's a lot of gravel pits around here. So uh, we, uh, we have good, just good drainage. Uh, so that uh, works against us when it's, uh, when it's a dry season. But uh, when we do get rain, uh, we can grow really, really good crops. 2018 was a drier year and you can see where the deficits are in that field by, uh, by these maps, they're very evident. And, uh, you know, comparing to 2017, obviously, uh, you know, much more even type of, uh, of looking yield pattern across the, uh, the colored map. And then you go to, you know, obviously 2018, uh, it definitely has the deficit areas showing them themselves quite evidently. We were back into uh, soybeans that year and uh, definitely better timely rainfalls in that particular area. 20, uh, 2019 did have a few dry pockets uh, throughout our area, but this one still had what we call timely rains in August to create that large soybean yield and uh, therefore showing the quite even uh, uh, crop uh, yields on that map that you're looking at, that we're looking at here for 20, 2019. Did have, uh, you know, still good crops uh, in general for 2020 on other farms, but they weren't wheat uh, because it was just too dry when wheat needed moisture, where some of the other crops uh, were okay without the, the moisture and still gave good yields. But so you can definitely see the deficit areas are really, really showing up there in uh in that uh, wheat field after looking at this map when we enrolled in the program uh we said to ourselves well uh let's go to another level and uh, we'll start to get some grid sampling done and uh, normally we would just soil sample uh randomly ever we are pretty faithful with our soil uh sampling program throughout our all of our farms so uh, every three years Everything is sampled, but it's the typical random sampling that most of us do. Uh, but the grid type system uh, we haven't done before. And uh, so that we were introduced to that and uh, to try to d get down to the nitty gritty of uh, how do we improve um, our profit on this farm? And then another level is the cover crop side of it, which we have been practicing generally uh, throughout our 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 properties, uh, but we don't have obviously the time and the energy to, you know, cover crop everything. There's too many acres. So uh, what we're going, what this profit mapping is going to uh, make us consider is to say the one, the p fields that are have the most deficit that need the most help are going to get the special treatment, you know, and get our time management. Uh, looked after in those areas. And uh, so that's uh, that's something that this program is causing us to uh, consider. In the future, we need, you know, if we're going to get really uh, down to the nitty gritty, so to speak, and, and spend the time and energy on sampling in grids and uh, treating these specific uh, deficit areas special, uh, we need to actually go to the next level in tracking everything at, with the financial side of it. So um, that would be something we are going to pursue. And uh, that way we get the whole package. It is worth the effort and it is worth the investment to go to profit mapping on more of our properties. So we are planning on, on doing that uh, funding or no funding. Uh, we've definitely seen the benefit through this. It's opened our eyes to say that this is a, uh, a way to make uh, a, a better profit on, on, a, on a property. We're hoping to get out of profit mapping. We're hoping to figure out, figure out the areas in the field that are obviously not profitable, but figure out why. I'm, I'd like to know why. So f the next step for us is for reasons why they're not profitable. And if it's something we can change, fix on, or, or is it something that's just, there's nothing we can do about it. 2014 on the DD farm we had soybeans 
just the background, this farm has on the south end, it has the Grand River. East and west sides are both tree lines, so it does show some um, areas of no profitability that some stuff we can't do anything about, whether it's the trees or the Grand River and beavers. Um, but in 2014, on the, the bottom end of the map, you can see that was actually white mold that caused that area. It, it's a creek flats there, so it's for some fairly growthy ground, and we lost that. But throughout the whole farm, you can see the very variability. Um, there is three different topography levels across this farm, um, starting down by the river and going up towards the road. After looking at that, I, it, you can see in the different areas um, that are less profitable, you can show a better map to show some of those why. 2015 was corn. You can see the, the outer areas where the, the coons and the beaver have taken its toll, but in the middle of the farm there, it's actually the, the high point was the profitable. 2016, the soybeans, we had a decent crop there, so the meat of the field did actually very well. Again, it does show what you do lose to the tree effect, to the, the critters at the river. In 2017, we had wheat, and this is where it really shows up, and if you look at the past maps, you can still see the same areas. The, the blue areas um, were drowned out. Uh, we ended up going in after this and actually running tile through those valleys. That year really showed us how much we were losing to water damage. So to try and prevent runoff, we put some surface water drain hickam bombs in and then actually systematically tiled those valleys. You can see that by doing so in 2018, we eliminated that problem. So th those valleys now do grow crop without any water damage. But again, looking at the maps, I know these farms, I've stared at these maps. You can still see the same areas that are showing to a point profitable versus not profit or less profitable maybe. So in my mind, why? We're still trying to figure out those whys. And then 19 soybeans again, it was a decent crop, but you can see down by the, the river there, we had um, some losses and that actually was all beaver. So actually we've sensed on this farm, actually there has been a, a buffer strip put in of, I think there's a 25 feet walking path all along the farm just to try and Get, get away from the river. And then 2020, we had a, it was a corn crop there again. It shows the same center area of the field that is more profitable than the rest. There is areas again that are less profitable, so I would like to go in and figure out why those areas are always showing up less profitable than the mean, the average of the field. The results of our profit mapping was Kind of what we expected, there was areas that surprised us more than others as far as the profitability um, was less than we expected. Um, we knew the areas were there, just it quantified it, put a true number to it for us. We used, I think, believe seven years worth of yield data and in the middle of that we tiled a valley of a farm and that the profit map did show that prior to that, that whole valley was not profitable, but once we've tiled it, it showed that actually it's a very profitable part of the farm. Uh, our next steps now that we've looked over the property ma mapping is figuring out our limiting factor whether it's fertility, drainage, or something we just can't fix. Going forward um, after looking at the profit, pro profit maps we're looking at sampling those zones that were not profitable and then making some business decisions on those areas um, for applying fertility or in one case um, for drainage. If you're considering investing in profit mapping, the first thing is make sure you have good data to start with. Make sure you have good records. Um, it's a great starting point. If you don't have that, it's hard to do. Um, the more years, the better, the more accurate the data is. The tools we use to, to support the different management decisions we do, um, we have, as I said, we use two different platforms for our data management. Um, we have, work with a, a local agronomist team that helps us out um, and I work with uh, my father who's been in the business and farmed this land a long time which is probably one of the best assets to help with all this. All right, I guess I'm back on the hot seat so thank you for supporting me on that uh, Sue. No problem. Uh, all right, so um, you heard both Brian and Tyler talking about uh, how they were 
um, choosing to manage their fields a little bit more spatially. And uh, so I, I kind of want to uh, talk about what they, they were referencing. Um, we look at, uh, for the most part, to keep things relatively simple. We talk about five different uh, uh, zone types. Um, the first is like a, a high yielding potential area, and but the fertility is uh, on the low side. So this is uh, usually identified through uh, um, yield maps or profitability maps um, combined with soil tests. So you're gonna see that with a lot of these. Um, and uh, the fact of the matter is the fertility is quite low in that usually because it's pulled a nice bit of nutrients out over the years. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and uh, so my experience on that is those areas can quite often put, be pushed to even further um, with a well-balanced uh, fertility uh, program that's going to address uh, some limiting uh, issues in there. So areas that you think are high yielding, maybe you can push even higher. The second one is, uh, I call this the uh, behind the old barn uh, zone, um, and that is because that's where the manure always got spread, um, and so the fertility levels are through the roof, um, and quite often uh, the yield potential is, is also uh, uh, very healthy in that area. Um, depending on what the fertility levels are, you might want to uh, draw back some of the, the nutrient levels uh, and mine it a little bit, um, also depending on the price of fertilizer. But uh, for the most part, you want to be making sure that you're maximizing the, the profit in those areas. The, uh, the next zone is a um, low uh, um, yield potential and low fertility. This is the pH uh, um, uh, scenario. So this is one of those cases where you're like, geez, that sand knoll, it should be yielding better. Um, what's going on there? You pull a soil test, you got a pH of 5.6. Hey, you throw some lime on there and you're off to the races. Um, uh, so it, so, it, so that it can be very helpful to be able to identify those. Tyler talked about uh, a tiling example uh, there where um, his, uh, his yield potential was low. Um, it wasn't a fertility situation for him. He was able to identify it was drainage, but he was able to uh, um, invest uh, and uh, get a stronger return on investment uh, because of it. Um, the next one is a low yielding potential zone and uh, um, high fertility levels. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this in the future, but uh, this is headlands. Um, quite often you see because of compaction that uh, um, the headlands just don't yield as well, but they've been getting fertilized the same way um, um, for the last uh, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. And because of it, the fertility levels are a little bit higher. Um, so, uh, the possibility of managing your headland uh, fertility uh, it becomes a little bit different. Um, and the final one, um, you don't see them happen uh, very, uh, very often, but very low yielding potential. Um, this is some of that stuff like uh, Tyler was talking about with some livestock, um, some natural livestock, some beavers there. Um, and so how he was able to manage that uh, with, a, with a grass uh, um, walkway ar around the field. Actually makes it really nice for crop scopes too, if you've got that there. Um, so anyway, let's talk about uh, zone creation because ultimately you're taking that yield data, you're taking that profitability map. And I showed you that and you heard Tyler and, and Brian talk about it. But the question is, is what do you do with it? So this is some data actually from a colleague uh, of mine. Um, and this is one of the fields that we picked on uh, for him. And you can see we've got four years of, of yield data um, and you can see that there's some consistent themes. And that's the really neat thing uh, when you get into profitability mapping is you can start to layer uh, um, uh, maps. It's uh, something that Tyler has uh, asked us to do for his fields is to be able to um, see what parts of the field are uh, not just uh, consistently doing, but what is his long-term returns. Um, so you're able to do that. There's our, there's our report that we talked about. You can see the parts of the field that are, are not making money. Um, if you're curious down here at the back end, well, that's uh, along a ditch. So he's got some deer and whatnot going on back there. So that, that's a problem for him. But there's also these very clear areas like the, this uh, sand ridge, there's a sand ridge here. And so he was able to soil sample based off that. You heard Brian talk about um, grid sampling. If you want a grid sample, uh, by, by all means, um, me, myself, I tend to be a proponent of what I call polygon sampling, which is what you see here. 
um, it's basically an intensive uh, zone sampling uh, approach. Um, won't get into really the, the reason why I like this. Um, ultimately, I, it's, it comes down to personal preference and, and what works to uh, um, show you, show a uh, farmer or an agronomist why the variability is there and what's causing it. Um, but then based on that, using the, those zones to soil samples. So there's the zones that we talked about. Um, and you can see this, so this, this farm, it, it tends to be a little bit on the sandier side. So um, because of it, uh, we're using a Bray P1 test instead of a bicarb. Hey, if you wanna use bicarb, by all means. But you can see um, uh, some of the, the fertility levels there for the, the phosphorus from the, the Bray P1. Um, and then you can also see for, from potash. And then this last one is magnesium. Um, so it allows the uh, farmer to, to start to decide how he uh, may or may not want to, to uh, uh, manage that uh, differently. Like uh, this at uh, this back end along the, the ditch, it's a little low on phosphorus, which uh, um, because of the damage from the deer, probably doesn't make a lot of sense to go and spread a pile of phosphorus there. Yeah, it might bring the phosphorus levels back up, but realistically, the deer is still going to eat there. Um, you're late, right along a, a waterway. Do you really want to be spreading more phosphorus back there? Eh, probably not. Uh, so, so it allows you to make uh, better decisions uh, that way. All right, so that's kind of the zone stuff. Sue and I can tell you about all kinds of pitfalls that uh, come into uh, profitability mapping. Um, and we're gonna talk about uh, some of them. Some of them uh, um, Sue and I got to experience for the first time. Some of them I have uh, had a lot of experience with and they showed up in this project uh, as well. And it's no one's fault. It's just the fact that this is the, the reality when it comes to profitability mapping. And what's really cool about this project and the role I get to play in it for, uh, today, today and uh, um, in general is um, I get to share um, my experiences around uh, profitability mapping and, and what you have to be aware of. So the first one is this data consistency piece. And what we mean by that is naming the same fields, the same thing in every monitor, by every operator and in every platform. So if you got a precision planter planting 2020 monitor that's connected to, that is uploaded into your, um, but then you have a John Deere sprayer and maybe a case combine, and you got three or four different uh, monitors, all named slightly different. Trying to be able to track that back can be a little bit of challenge unless you set things up uh, correctly. Um, Tyler is a, is a great example of a guy who, who really likes working with his data and he's taking the time to make sure that his data is uh, uh, um, nice and clean. Um, that wasn't the case uh, for, for everyone. For the most part, people in this project they did a pretty good job. Um, actually, I'll be honest with you, on a scale of one to 10, this project, I would say they were about an 8.5 to a nine because I get to see some really ugly stuff. Um, when we talk in um, data consistency, the big one that you'll often hear is people talk about grower, farm, field. So the grower in this case would be Tyler Blaine um, or Tyler, uh, Tyler McBlaine or McBlain uh, Family Farms, whatever you wanted to call it. And then the farm is, um, maybe it's the, I think he, the farm he was showing us was the DD farm, right? But then what do you call the field name? Well, the entire DD farm is one field. So the number one field name in North America, if you look at all the data, the most consistent, and some of you are, gonna, are probably guessing and thinking it's the home farm. Well, it is high up there but it's not number one. So you might be saying it's grandpa's. Grandpa's is also high up there, but it's not number one. Um, another common one I see is uh, the Smith farm, right? Must've been a lot of Smiths back in the day because everyone seems to have a Smith farm. It's not Smith either. The number one field name in North America is one. That is correct. After you put in your grower, you put it in your farm, you just want the monitor to run. So you just type one and you go. Well, if you're doing a filter on field names and you've got 20 different uh, field names and they're all named one, it makes it harder to clean up. 
Yes, there's tools to be able to clean it up and auto sorts and stuff like that, but you need to know how to use it. So one of the things that uh, I uh, encourage people to do is make sure that your uh, grower farm fields are set up or pay someone to set it up. Um, it doesn't take a, someone who's comfortable with the software, they can do it very quickly. The next one is product names. This drives me absolutely bonkers. Just in nitrogen, we have 28%, 28 UAN, 28 OO, 28% UAN, UAN, 28. That's just 28. Heaven forbid if uh, you're one of those farmers that might, uh, maybe you're using 32% one year. So literally every year this gets changed a, a little bit um, or multiple operators, if, if you've got multiple operators. Um, same with uh, uh, varieties. Someone might uh, put it in as decal 5284. And the next person might put it in as just 5284. The next one might be DKC 5284, DK 5284. And then of course there's people like myself who once in a while have fat fingers and you meant to put in 5284 and you actually typed in 5248 and that changes everything again. So being able to clean that data, it takes time. And we talked about it. farmers are busy. Expecting them to be able to clean that data um, takes time and that is a challenge. Accurate costs. This is an interesting uh, conversation. Some of them are pretty simple uh, and straightforward, right? Most, most farmers will be able to tell you what they paid uh, for a ton of uh, um, MAP or a ton of uh, potash uh, the past spring or the price of their uh, bag of seed corn. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. Equipment becomes a little bit more interesting. Um, my experience is nine out of 10 uh, farmers when I ask them what is their cost for equipment, they're gonna tell me use OMAFRA um, uh, standard rates. Um, that's the ones that they're most uh, um, comfortable, comfortable with. Um, yes, there's a small segment of farmers that have their costs of equipment down uh, to, to fine tooth uh, number and they know exactly what it is. But the vast majority use, use the OMAFRA survey rates. Um, like I said, occasionally you run into replacement costs, but for the most part, survey rates, um, having that uh, printed off uh, and uh, handy definitely comes in uh, um, uh, nicely. And then the final one is in this area is land costs. Um, actual versus opportunity. Land costs is always a tough one. Um, for this project, we did not include it. And the reason we did not include it was because there's such a um, there, there's such a variance in what you should use. If you're renting the ground, hey, that's pretty easy what your land cost is. But if you've owned if you own that ground and you just bought it in the last two to three years, your land cost can look a lot different in your mind than say if you've owned that farm for 30, 40 years or you inherited that that land, right? And and understanding how that works be really, really challenging. So when we get talking to farmers around this, um, I'll encourage them to be thinking, we'll, we'll pull the land cost out. We can put it back in, but initially we pull it out and we show them what their average costs are. And we point out that, hey, this does not include land costs. Um, but we talk about this concept of opportunity cost. If they were to rent the ground to their neighbor, what could they realistically get for that, uh, that uh, land? Um, and that way they can understand, um, is it the, the um, best business decision to be farming that? Um, and I'm not saying that we have to be uh, making farming decisions based purely on business uh, um, acumen, right? Um, we talked about businesses want to see between a 10 and 15% return on investment and in agriculture, some years that, that's just not possible. Um, but it comes down to being aware, being that, that awareness. So, so opportunity versus actual cost is important. All right, profitability mapping. This, I just, I just had to share this story with you. I, got, I actually had to get permission to share the story for, you'll see it for uh, why. Um, everybody talks about how easy it is. And I talked about some of the pitfalls and the time that it can take to, to, to be able to do. 
Um, I do a bunch of it for uh, some of the farmers that I work with and some of the ag retailers that I, I do do it with. They're just too busy. They're just like, literally, I sometimes feel like the accountant getting a box, uh, shoebox full of, of receipts. So the story I wanted to share with you, um, my girlfriend uh, decided to go uh, camping with her uh, two youngest and a nephew back on uh, June 25th. Now, the reason I remember um, June 25th was because it rained a little bit. Um, I'm not sure how much rain you guys got uh, in uh, the Grand River uh, area, but just outside of Chatham, we actually had an area that got 11 inches of rain that night. You can just imagine how, how things went. So I had helped her get ready. She actually uh, um, uh, borrowed my vehicle so that way she could have the cooler and the tents and everything. She, she borrowed a tent from her sister and um, the tent looked, uh, was, it was this design. Um, and uh, her sister told her, hey, it's super simple. You just pop it up. Um, it instantly pops into this, uh, this shape and you're set to go. And let's face it, we looked at the weather forecast. We knew it was going to be raining. Um, I was uh, watching my radar and telling her when she might be able to, to run out of the car and get her tent set up. So, so she's got this uh, ready to go. And uh, I kept letting her know and say, hey, it looks like there's going to be a, a window of no rain. How are you making out? And I didn't hear anything for, for quite a while. Uh, finally, I got this. Yeah. The next person that told my girlfriend that that tent was easy was going to have to eat that tent. She was not happy. She eventually did get set up. But just because people tell you it's easy doesn't mean it's always easy. Remember, we got to get back to that simple piece. It's simple to understand. It might not be easy to execute. Um, it's software engineers. Yeah, they're working with it all the time. Some of the challenges that uh, you run into uh, we talked a little bit about data transfer. You have multiple platforms. Um, a John Deere 2630 is maybe a little bit different than John Deere 2600. Um, one needs a card reader, one needs a thumb drive. Um, a 2020 monitor, how you pull the data looks a little bit different. Um, maybe the farmer uh, uh, has the data in uh, uh, operation center from John Deere, or maybe they have a copy of Ag Leader SMS. Uh, maybe it's Ag Leader Basic, maybe it's Ag Leader Advanced. Um, so being comfortable moving that uh, data around, um, the file types, uh, it's getting better, but, uh, in file types, one of the big things, one of the standards in, in the data world is something called a shapefile. Um, a shapefile has a minimum of three files, um, all named exactly the same, uh, with a slightly different extension. Usually they have four files, but you can get away with three. Um, but when you ask someone for a shapefile, one of those files is, let's call it Aaron's field dot SHP. And they assume, well, that must be the shape file. And they only send you the one out of the three. Um, so that, that, that is a big issue, um, knowing uh, which data to be able to send. Um, John Deere runs into a, a similar situation that if you don't have the right folders, it just doesn't read in. So, so we, we run into some challenges that way. Um, talked about uh, the, the software platforms. Um, when you get into profitability mapping, there's a bunch of different ones out there and you have to be comfortable moving that, to, that, that around and, and working with the data. And same with the data. Like if you're working with multiple combines in the field, this gets to be a challenge. Um, I'm at, I've actually just recently invested in some new software coming out of Australia that allows us to be able to calibrate uh, on multiple uh, combines in the same field a lot better. Um, and one of the reasons I had to invest in that is because I'm doing more work in Western Canada and in the, in the U.S. Where, where multiple combines are much more common. But even in Ontario, you do see it. Um, same with, the, with what we call post-harvest calibration. Um, if the yield data says that the field yielded two, on an average of 250 bushels per acre, but in reality it yielded 195, that's a big swing. Sure, the areas match up, but you need to have that uh, post-harvest uh, calibrated uh, data. Um, and if you don't do a, a decent job of it, yeah, you can make nice, pretty colorful maps, um, but it limits what you can do with it. Um, everyone in this uh, project, uh, they were great being able to give me good data. We had to do some post-harvest calibration, some uh, combine merging stuff, nothing uh, too onerous. Um, Hats off to all the participants. 
because nobody sent me a PDF of their yield maps saying, here's my yield data. Believe it or not, I do get that. Um, to do profitability mapping right, you do need the actual uh, raw data. Um, another thing, all of the participants in this program, um, we were doing single fields, in some cases, two fields. Um, when where profitability mapping comes in, and you heard Brian talk about this, I want to be able to see this on all my fields because now you're able to rank your fields and you'll be able to say, okay, of my corn fields, which ones were the highest yield or the highest profitability and lowest profitability, which had the most variability and the least variability. Um, there is an argument to be made around this that the scalability brings huge, huge value uh, here. And then the most recent year versus uh, historical uh, um, years, um, it's a memory thing. Hey, how much fertilizer did you put down there three years ago? Uh, I don't know, use whatever the provincial average is. Um, what did you pay for fertilizer? I don't know. What did you pay for seed? I don't know. Um, so so th those are some of the challenges uh, that you run into with that. I'm gonna show you, share one last thing, um, an extension of profitability mapping. And this is what we call um, uh, nutrient uh, tracking. Uh, this is a fun one to, to share. Uh, just let me double check on time. See how maybe I need to skip. Um, do it super fast. So you can see different parts of the field are gonna remove different pounds uh, of phosphorus. Um, so your high yielding parts of the field are gonna remove the most amounts of MAP. Um, but if you think about it, when you have a little bit of extra fertilizer and the spreader left over, where do you spread it? Well, my experience is you spread it in the lowest yielding areas. Those are the parts that are already building. So are you building or mining your worst, best soil? And if you think about where the runoff and erosion is, quite often it's the lower yielding areas that have erosion problems. Um, so you can actually get into geospatial nutrient tracking. So. Yeah, some, some fun stuff that you can get into if, you, if you're um, big into mapping. Um, just some quick observations. I have seen a huge increase in the amount of soil sampling um, that's happening in Ontario and the intensity. You heard Brian talk about this, that he's going to grid sampling. Um, you're seeing more um, uh, uh, attention being paid to 4R, um, the societal obligations and government regulations. regulations. You might not agree with it, but Fact of the matter is, it's here and it's here to stay. So uh, being able to manage that accordingly. Um, the last few years, I have seen extremely high rates of, of potassium going out um, because farmers have had money to invest back into the into their ground. Um, with the higher fertilizer prices, is that going to continue? I, I'm not. I don't think so. Um, I expect to see some really high yields this year, and that's probably going to put a lot of fields in a mining situation. Um, there are high commodity prices right now. Farmers are gonna have uh, money and where, where are they gonna invest that back in? Because fertilizer prices have gone up and um, they've known it's probably gonna happen a little bit slower, but now that's happening, it's happening in a big way. And then the final thing is these uh, super planters uh, with dry fertilizers. So what is a super planter? Here's a super planter, um, 24, 30 inch rows, so 60, uh, 60 feet wide. Um, it does multi-variety, so it, it plants two different varieties, um, and both varieties can be variable rated. There, you have a three-bin commodity card for fertilizers, um, so there's actually three different blends here. One of the blends is in furrow, um, and then the other two blends will, um, will change rates, and, uh, and depending on soil test uh, levels, um, for a two-by-two two, uh, dry. And then the fun part is the grower wants all of that to uh, um, empty out at the same time so he doesn't have multiple fill-ups. All right, that's all I've got. Let's get to uh, the questions. And there's uh, Sue and uh, my uh, contact information. Thank you so much, Aaron. You are such a great presenter and storyteller. I, you couldn't hear me, but with your analogy about the tent, I laughed out loud. It was so great. Um, so we'll take any questions right now. If you've got any, um, just put up your hand and we'll unmute you. Um, you can do that by, there's a reactions button at the bottom, so you can raise your hand that way. If you happen to be shy, it's great that Aaron has put his contact information there too. So if you prefer to just uh, contact either one of us one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you can do that following this, uh, this workshop or this webinar. 
So we'll see if anybody's got any questions. Oh, I see Anne. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I think I'm unmuted. Aaron, how many contractors are there that provide this service currently? Is it mostly southwestern Ontario or is that spreading across central Ontario as well? So um, I'm, I'm not sure of how many um, individual um, consultants would provide it um, with a specific list. A lot of consultants and a lot of ag retailers um, have the ability to do this um, if, if you request to request it or they can give you guidance. Um, so, so you, if, if, and the really neat thing when it comes to data is they do not have to, um, live in down the road from you. Like th this is a prime example, um, where I live in Chatham and I was able to support this, this project, uh, uh, fairly well. There is, there is, a um, a lot of, um, independent consultants, ag retailers that do want to help and support uh, support around uh, this, th this type of stuff. Thanks, Aaron. Oh, you got a follow up, Ann? Uh, if, I don't know if you know how to answer this, Aaron, but uh, is there, can you provide some general idea of what this service costs? Like, is it a, is it charged kind of per acre or is it, does it depend on 15 different factors? That's a great question, uh, um, Anne. Um, so, uh, and the reason I say it's a great question is because I've been uh, looking at uh, um, modifying our pricing uh, structure. Um, historically, I've uh, built it out on a per acre uh, basis. Um, and, and my target uh, number was, uh, was $2.50 uh, per acre. Um, but that said, uh, I talked about the scalability of when you're working with an entire operation. So what we've changed around on the pricing is to go to a per, per farm or per field uh, on basis on, on uh, pricing um, to, to make things uh, more attractive. Um, and usually you're looking at, I talk what I, a full farm operation, um, usually around like $50 a, a farm. Um, so like $50 a field or $50 a farm. Um, combined into an entire operation is is uh, the general idea of pricing. You'll, you'll see a lot of people will offer the service as a bundle package, and, I, and I'm no different. Um, I don't do a lot of standalone uh, um, profit mapping. I do a lot of uh, profit mapping as part of a, a bigger package uh, um, that includes uh, very, very prescriptions, soil sampling, um, crop planning, um, agronomics, stuff like that. Okay, are there any further questions for Aaron, our map guru right here? No? Okay, well, thank you so much, Aaron. I appreciate you sharing your in-depth knowledge with everybody. Um, if you were shy and you still have questions, uh, hopefully you copied down some information from Aaron about how to connect with him. If not, um, we'll be sending out uh, a link for the recording. You can always connect with us to get uh, his information or our information if you want to talk to us. So I hope everybody has a great night and uh, happy rest of the summer. Perfect. Thanks, Sue. Thanks, everyone. It was great to uh, share what we've been working on. Thank you, Aaron.